Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis. I'm once again a uh, host of the Praise of Five podcast. I'm once again joined by Keith Preston, Alexei, and Florian. Thank you very much for being here, everybody. Today's discussion was uh, brought forward by – discussion topic was brought forth by Keith Preston, uh, the Lewis brothers' uh, view on left and right politics. Are they even a helpful concept? So since this was sort of your uh, idea, Keith, why don't you sort of introduce the audience to the Lewis brothers and their thesis? Uh, there was a book published uh, about a year ago by two brothers named Hiram Lewis and Verlin Lewis. And one of them is a professor at one of the affiliates of Brigham Young University. The other one is a professor somewhere I can't remember. Uh, their fields of specialization mm -hmm. are political science. And I think one of them is a political scientist. I think the other one is a historian. Um, I'm not quite sure about that. Um, but they, they're credentialed experts in relevant fields. And um, they're, they're both uh, Mormons, and they're also both somewhat libertarian-leaning, not, not necessarily hardcore libertarians like an anarcho-capitalist, but nominally libertarian. Uh, and they wrote a book called The Myth of Left and Right, and they're saying that um, a lot of the claims that are made about what separates the left and right, particularly in the context of modern day American politics uh, is inaccurate because uh, much of this tries to reduce the differences between left and right to some kind of essentialism. Uh, for instance, um, one of the more sophisticated theories about what separates the left and right is uh, what Thomas Sowell calls the constrained versus unconstrained vision, or you know, uh, more simplistically, the, the realist versus utopian vision. Uh, you know, the idea is that people on the right are about empirical facts and hard-nosed realism, whereas people on the left are about pie-in-the-sky dreaming and utopianism. Um, and that's an oversimplification of Sowell's views, but that's a, a fairly common view of the difference between left and right. Uh, another common uh, denotation is uh, tradition versus progress, and that is the idea that well, conservatives believe in upholding tradition because they see value in tradition because if something has been a tradition for a long time, there's probably a reason for that. It's probably some utility to tradition, whereas uh, the left will say, no, traditions uh, oppress, oppress everyone and are used to uh, maintain vested interests. Uh, that's another common view of what the difference between the left and right is. Uh, another one has to do with um, uh, equality and inequality. It's thought that the right will say, well, we believe in hierarchy, we believe in authority, uh, whereas the left supposedly believes in e egalitarianism or, or equality. Um, and then there's also uh, views of human nature. Uh, you know, it's, it's claimed that the right believes that human nature is um, very fixed and limited, and that uh, whereas the left believes that human nature is malleable or human nature can be perfected through the right set of circumstances, you know, education, social conditions and things like that. Um, and all of these ideas are, are not necessarily wrong. I mean, there are people who represent these kinds of ideas you can find all over the place and throughout history. But the Lewis brothers argue that modern American politics can't be reduced to these single determinants. Uh, for instance, uh, when it comes to the utopianism versus realism, one example they give is George W. Bush. They'll say, well, he's supposed to be a conservative. But then you know, when he gives speeches claiming that he's going to uh, end, end evil in the world and stuff like that, well, what could be more utopian than that? Um, or uh, he'll quote, uh, he'll, one thing they do is they quote some uh, left-wing thinkers who say that, well, you know, the conservatives who believe that everything should just be left up to the market or civil society or whatever without government intervention, you know, that's a utopian idea. They think they believe in the inherent goodness of people that, you know, businesses and uh, citizens or whatever are just going to do what's do what's right. Whereas, no, we need we need government intervention to prevent uh, bad, bad people from doing bad things. Uh, so. Um, so they use a number of examples like this, and there's a lot of this in the book um, and in also in interviews. The, the Lewis brothers have done 
a number of interviews with uh, they did one with Brian Kaplan that's pretty good. They did one with Coleman Hughes. Uh, there are others, and a lot of these are on YouTube. Uh, but that's the essence of their thinking. The essence of the Lewis brothers' thinking is that the left and right are largely meaningless, uh, at least in a modern context, and that there's a uh, trying to reduce it down to these singular determinants is, is a flawed enterprise. They'll say that maybe in a historical sense, there was some meaning to this, like the original meaning of left and right is in, uh, comes from the French Revolution, where you have the monarchists sitting on the right side of the, of the National Assembly and the, and the Republicans sitting on the left side. And that's what left and right meant in, in 19th century European politics. Uh, and then uh, another thing, another example they, they raise, I can't remember if this is in the book or not. I've heard them talk about this in interviews. Uh, where they talk about it in, in communist terminology, like in the early 20th century, you started to see um, the, the terms left and right uh, used in an ideological context. For instance, in a lot of traditional Stalinist type terminology, they'll talk about left Trotskyite deviationists or right Bukharanite deviationists or or left or ultra left deviationist and, and what they're basically talking about is you know rival factions of communists and why they're supposedly going in the wrong direction here and there uh and it's they argue that that's how the terms left and right entered modern discourse that uh, it was largely through the influence of, of communist terminology and it's being transferred to other uh part places on the political spectrum uh, and as far as contemporary American politics, they'll say that there's no inherent relationship between the uh, different uh, positions that different political factions take. For instance, today, if you're thought of as being somebody on the right, that supposedly means, well, you believe in a, a strong national defense, you know, hawkish on foreign policy, tax cuts and deregulation of business, uh, traditional social conservatism, you know, pro-religion, pro, religion, pro uh, or anti-abortion, pro-nuclear family, whereas if you're on the left, well, you supposedly believe in an interventionist, activist government, and you believe in reliance on international institutions like the UN, or you believe in a large welfare state, or you believe in laws to protect civil rights for disadvantaged people, or and it's they will say these positions aren't necessarily related. You know, like what does abortion have to do with taxes? or what does uh, environmentalism have to do with gay rights? So that's that's generally the paradigm that these uh, that the Lewis brothers introduce. Right now, I, I you had put up a few like articles and interviews that they had done in our private Facebook chat, and I was able to catch the one with Brian Kaplan, and they make a lot of really I think salient points. One of the points that they make that I, I've made before myself is they'll say that when you talk to like these political ideologues, they'll say, well, we represent everything that's good in the world, and our opponents represent everything that's bad in the world. A good example of this was like 10 years ago, you had like the left libertarians represented by C4SS, and like the right libertarians represented by like certainly Hoppe and many Mises uh, people, and they would try to define right and left as, so if you were like, say, from C4SS, and you'd say, oh, well, uh, right just means authoritarian. So, you know, Stalin is on the right. And then, you know, if you were like a hoppy and you'd say, no, no, leftism is authoritarianism. So Hitler's on the right and or on the left. And it's like, you know, it's just self-serving. And they, 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 they talk about the self-serving nature of these definitions because it doesn't really help. Uh, like, for example, Keith, we did a show a few months ago about democracy or political systems. I mean, you could have a democracy of fundamentalist Muslims that's called Iran, right? You have elections. Just because they're fundamentalist Muslims doesn't mean that the, the structure of government. There's, there's been this confusion where you have, on the one hand, the structure of government with a set of social and religious beliefs. Those two are distinct from each other. You, you could have a, a, an atheist republic where everybody doesn't believe in God. You could have a fundamentalist Islamic Republic, like Iran. It it doesn't matter, right? Because what matters is the structure of the government, not necessarily the discrete beliefs of individuals, though that, of course, will impinge to some degree on how this government actually you know, operates in practice. The other thing they point out is they, they don't go, at least not in the interview, they didn't go too deep into this, but they mentioned uh, 
the the problem of the question of universals where you know they mentioned nominalism as this idea which says that there are no universals and they're like well that's bad we don't agree with that modern political discourse is often like this we believe in essentialism so there was some kind of realist i think plato even gets brought up in this discussion and the idea being that well you know a, a well ordered religion or a well ordered political theory would have to be essentialist like all the tenets that it has ought to be related to each other in some way and they argue that there are existing things like that like for example broad religious traditions you know they're mormon but they also mention judaism islam and christianity hinduism and they also mention like earlier political platforms prior to like the 1930s so they're not saying that it can't happen just that it's not happening currently in our discourse in america they also brought up a really good point about you know, what does left right and left even mean right if depending on the level of analysis of terms let's just use use definition based on historical precedent the left has always meant anti-capitalism and labor organization, whether you're a Marxist, a socialist, or, an, or um, an anarchist. And yet, now we have many people who identify as leftists who are pro-free market, like Bill Clinton. You have actual Marxists advocating for open borders in Western Marxist parties, which is a obviously free market position. No socialist would ever have supported open borders for the very obvious reason that it would crash the value of labor. So what does left mean in that context? What does it even mean to be a Marxist and be pro-open borders? Um, so in the use definition, the Lewis brothers are right. This whole thing is kind of dissolving into a meaningless collage, right? And and the one brother, I forget who he was, I think it was a, the one who was a professional historian rather than sociologist, said that, you know, it, back in 2008, Bush was far right. Now Trump is far right. So, so what exactly does far right mean if it includes both George W. Bush who's now considered a moderate centrist and one of the good boys by even like former, I mean, I think there was a video even where like Vosh was like shilling for Bush against Trump. So it's just like, it's totally meaningless in its current construction. Now, one of the things that I, I was working on a few years back was this idea of, I guess what you might call a, in the way that biological organisms are classified based on hylomorphic similarities I argued that that's how we should classify political systems. So like, you know, there was the idea of a horseshoe theory. Well, if you're both authoritarian, you're on the same side. Oh, you know, Nazis and communists. Well, no, that's, that's stupid. Like the Nazis, the communists, the Russians are the Chinese emperor. We're all authoritarian. But other than that, what do they have in common? Practically nothing. All their ideologies are radically different from each other. And, and, you know, that's, I think, what's more important. What is their underlying ideology rather than the expression of that ideology? And I think that's sort of what the, the in one sense, what the Lewis brothers are trying to do, have this more coherent, cohesive definition of political realities. They also want to move towards issues-based politics. Like they said in the 30s and 40s, Democrats and Republicans were very similar on many issues. Uh, certainly cultural issues. They only diff, diff, debated a few issues like immigration, or, or uh, you know, interventionism, actual discrete political issues, not these, you know, vague Manichaean concepts. So, I, I think I think that, and you know, at one point, Brian Kaplan says you're telling all your critics or all of your colleagues that they have a poorly thought out worldview and are just not very intelligent. And they're like, yes, and I'm like, that was that was the best part of the interview because it's so true. All these academicians just have these completely childish fantasies of the world and their political systems are completely in fact it's not only what do they have to do with each other they have nothing to do with each other what does a radical environmentalist have to do with a working class uh, coal union worker they have two mutually exclusive objectives one wants to deindustrialize one wants to keep his coal jobs what does an industrial worker have in common with an open borders like you know the democratic party right Nothing, because the open borders would crash the value of his labor. What does a feminist have in common with a Muslim? I mean, the entire democratic coalition is an insane mishmash of competing incompatible positions. And so, and on the Republican Party, you could say the same thing. What does a Christian fundamentalist have in common with like a New York Wall Street businessman? Practically nothing. In fact, they have competing interests. And, and so what I think the Lewis brothers are showing us is that this is a patronage system rather than a system of principal government positions. Uh, Alexi. All right. Well, I have a lot to say about this. And uh, I have a rather 
let us say, non-national perspective on the left versus right issue, because I've lived in seven different countries. And I understand that the Lubas brothers wrote this book as Americans for the American audience. In fact, just earlier today, I was watching an interview with a with an African-American gentleman who interviewed him. I'm forgetting his name, unfortunately. Uh, and he interviewed both of these brothers, and he talked about how he, he knows quite a bit about the Puerto Rican system and how the principal issue of political discourse there is different from that of the U.S. And, for example, there is the, the principal issue there, should Puerto Rico be a U.S. territory? Yes, Coleman Hughes. Thank you, Keith. So he, he discussed how in a, there the, the principal issue, should Puerto Rico be uh, an independent state or should it be a territory of the U.S.? And that's what determines whether you are right or left leaning in Puerto Rico. How about Israel? What about there? Well, the principal question is how do you relate to Palestine? Whether what you think about abortion, gay rights, environmentalism, whatever, 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 is specific to cultural context, it doesn't really matter. You can be on the right and the left, and you can agree with whoever in the U.S. on this, on this issue. And in fact, I've seen a wonderful interview with Douglas Murray, where, where, where the interviewer showed him a little clip of how American social justice warrior activists we're talking about how their support for Palestine aligns with their support for abortion. And one of the one of the commentators who was cited in the interview mentioned, well, what the hell is this? This doesn't even make any sense. If a Palestinian woman wants an abortion, she's got to go to Israel. And what's the point of this? Well, what they're driving at is the intersectionality thesis. It makes no sense whatsoever. The intersectionality thesis teaches naive university students to believe that there is only one system of oppression and that's white male christian wasp only the wasp people can be oppressed you see what they'll teach you is that if you are an african-american person or hispanic or you're female or you're lgbtq you may be biased you may be bigger you may be a misandrist but guess what i mean that doesn't actually make you racist sexist or whatever because you somehow don't have the power oh wait a second what if you're maxine walters what if you're Barack Obama and you say you're black, although your mother is white? Does this mean that you can't actually be racist or sexist in a way that harms some people? Perhaps there are some underclass white American people who were harmed by Barack Obama's policies. Perhaps Barack Obama is not entirely racially faithful to some African American communities. So this, what I'm getting at is the intersectionality thesis is absolute nonsense in the strictest sense of the term. And the Lewis brothers have demonstrated that remarkably trenchantly. And uh, so we'll, we'll put that here, that essentially the idea of uh, right versus left is necessarily specific to culture, history, and context. And I've seen this in my own experience in a way that aligns with the observations of Coleman Hughes. I was born in Russia and I've lived my first 11 years in Russia. And there I, I grew up under President Boris Yeltsin, in fact, the only president of Russia who was democratically elected. And Boris Yeltsin uh, was known for his public displays of solidarity with President Clinton. In fact, Boris Yeltsin adhered to many tenets of the Washington consensus. And this is why Clinton gladly visited Moscow and uh, showed his support for Yeltsin. In fact, Clinton played an instrumental role in supporting Yeltsin. Now, Americans who are watching this, they might think that Boris Yeltsin may have been a leftist to that time because he is a friend of Bill Clinton. On the other hand, some American amateur historians would say that Boris Yeltsin was a far-right president because he was for free markets. He was for diminishing the role of government in Russia. He was a, he was a subscriber of a lot, and he subscribed to a lot of beliefs and ideas that Ronald Reagan espoused. In fact, uh, uh, Yeltsin may have even gone so far to agree with Ronald Reagan that the government is the problem, not the solution. And despite all of this, Bill Clinton, Boris Yeltsin, they're all more, let us say, neoliberal or even in some ways libertarian than George W. Bush or any, uh, any number of re Republican icons, such as, say, Richard Nixon. Okay, so that's a cultural context. Now, why is it that in Russia, Boris Yeltsin was a far leftist? Is it because of some essential issue that he has in common with Bill Clinton? No, that's total nonsense. The reason why Boris Yeltsin was considered to be a leftist is because he went against the system. And the system then was communist. And uh, 
even there within the system, the biggest enemy that Boris Yeltsin had was Gorbachev, who was despised for having been a leftist in the Soviet Union. Why is that? For glasnost and perestroika. What does glasnost mean? Transparency. What does perestroika mean? Reconstruction. So Yellow Gorbachev was seen as a far left candidate in the Communist Party, although in fact he was a, an ardent, steadfast, staunch communist. And yet for Yeltsin, that was not left leaning enough. So this is an example of, of the demonstration, the, the Lewis brothers' thesis at York, that whatever we mean by left or right depends not only on, on culture, history, and, and political context, but also depends on a specific epoch that happens. In, in any given country. For instance, be, before, before even the communist revolution, I would imagine that, that there would have been some instances of, of uh, market reformers who were considered to be somewhat right-leaning. For instance, uh, Yeltsin's new economic, I'm sorry, Lenin's new economic policy was in, in a way in a way, somewhat right-leaning, because he introduced some measures of capitalism at that point. See the, uh, but on the other hand, in the U.S. and in the U.K., you know, Lenin would have been seen as a leftist communist. This is all specific to culture, context, and history. So if we take the fourth turning perspective by Neil Hobb and William Strauss, he, talk, he discusses at length how American culture changed repeatedly over 80 years saculum. For them, saculum is, is what defines an epoch. So this saculum happened in, that we're in now started with FDR's triumph over his right-leaning enemies who tried to stage a coup against him, some of which support Mussolini. We're still in this. And why are we thinking that this idea of left and right, the way FDR defined, makes no sense at all? Well, because we're in, again in the fourth turn. We're in the final stage of this epoch. In the final stage of the saculum, that it's no wonder that we've come so far, we've deviated so far away from reality as FDR knew it in the 30s and 40s that it just doesn't add up. As, as the Lewis brothers discussed, for FDR, the issue was fairly simple, that FDR wanted more government. FDR believed that the way to pull the nation out of the Great Depression was to expand the state. And well, uh, he was known as a liberal at that point, but that seemed absurd to some of the commentators. You see, FDR in the 1930s was in the same juncture of history as we are now, the very tail end of the fourth turning. At that point, FDR was spouting things that seemed to have gone contrary to all established wisdom. Back then, in the late 19th century, a liberal was a supporter of the Gilded Age hands-off, government, that the government should take a hands-off approach. And uh, FDR was saying total, totally opposite, that as a liberal, he himself would be in favor of expanding the role of government. So we were seeing similar kinds of contradictions nowadays, that what, that what was established previously in FDR's era, epoch, 1860s, after the Civil War, made no sense in the 1930s. And FDR paved the way for a new era. Now, they we're still holding on to the, to the paradigms that FDR established. And we just don't think of what it means to be a liberal or a conservative in any way that's faithful or to, to his point of view or consistent with it in any way at all. But does the left or right really mean anything at all? I would say yes. This is what the Lewis brothers have missed. Essentially, it's a matter of dispositions. In fact, the most famous conservative, Edmund Burke, defined conservatism as a, as a psychological personality type, a disposition. In fact, even Theodore Kaczynski and his Unabomber Manifesto described leftism not as any specific belief system, but as a, as a personality type. You see, it just so happened, as, as, as Tab Kaczynski understood, that leftists in his era, the leftists who were his colleagues in academia and in the math department, believed in certain things. But then Kaczynski took a pause there and said, wait a second, does my critique of leftists apply to communists, to Bolsheviks? And he balked at answering that question. Theodore Kaczynski said, we don't really know. For the purpose of my discussion, we're looking at leftists of the modern era as a personality type. We're not talking about any some grand sweeping global leftist label that applies to Stalinist, Maoist, whatever, Hitlers. That's a nonsense question. And uh, Ted Kaczynski being a an exceptionally gifted mathematician had a sharp analytical mind that let him cut through this, uh, this rigmarole of universal labels. And this is where I see uh, 
a point of commonality that really leftism and rightism are points of cultural instances. So I'll give you one more example before I call it a day with us. Uh, for Spain today, that uh, today Pedro Sanchez, you know, the, the, the current prime minister of Spain, is seen as a staunch leftist. Is it because of his support for the COVID lockdown policies? No, it's because he literally dug Francisco Franco out of the grave, uh, out of the mausoleum that resembled a resting place for Egyptian pharaohs. pharaohs. And he put him in, in, into public cemetery in Madrid, a distinguished cemetery there. But okay, so this is Spain's big issue. How do you feel about the Franco dictatorship? Do you think it was the biggest monstrosity comparable with Stalin or even Hitler? If so, you're definitely a leftist. But wait, so let's look at what happened in the 1990s. President, Prime Minister, excuse me, Felipe Gonzalez is famous for having liberalized Spain. That in a way he, he advocated for many far market reforms in ways that Pedro Sanchez would not support. Pedro Felipe Gonzalez in the 1990s has, <coughs> and has really made Spain a free country in the modern sense of the earth. Free markets, lower taxes, more tourism, <coughs> you know, everything you can possibly imagine as being liberal in the 19th century American sense of the earth, gilded liberal, although he did advocate for some for some aspects of the welfare state. But what made him liberal in the context of Spanish politics? Well, that he was against the Francisco Franco. He was for opposing the Franco dictatorship. And how about how about Pedro Sanchez? He is less liberal in the market sense of the earth than, than Felipe Gonzalez, the modern prime minister of Spain. But he's more extreme, he's more hawkish on Franco. He's, he's more hawkish on eliminating various symbols of the Franco's dictatorship in Spain. That's what, in the eyes of many Spaniards, makes Pedro Sanchez more on the left than, say, Felipe Gonzalez. So uh, to top it off, I would say that, that really there is one central issue in every country that people obsess over, over and above anything. In Spain, it's the Franco dictatorship. In the U.S., it's probably the woke stuff. In Puerto Rico, statehood for Puerto Rico. In Israel, it's the Palestine question. You name it. In Brazil, it's uh, having lived in Brazil, I can tell you. The, the, the real question is, do you support the Western powers like Bolsonaro, or do you see yourself in, in league with the, with the BRICS and the Global South? If you see yourself in league, be as being in league with the BRICS and the Global South, and you're a leftist. If you support the U.S. like Bolsonaro, then you're a rightist. See, there is one cardinal issue for every for most countries that we know of, and this is how they understand the left and right issue to be. But there are, and I would say there are also personality differences between leftists and righteous. I would say there is some merit of Jonathan Haidt's research that in every country, in most countries, conservatives tend to be more loyal to their group, which is usually defined in, in fundamental biological traits. And, uh, and, and, and on the other hand, uh, liberals tend to be more interested in the concept of caring for, for anybody. You see, but then somebody may ask you on the side of the Lewis brothers, isn't it that conservatives can be really caring and compassionate people when it comes to their church, when it comes to child rear, and when it comes to protecting people from pornography? Yes, of course. But, but they also care about loyalty. You see, conservatives don't want to give away their money for the sake of supporting people who are unchristian and disloyal and disrespectful and profane and vulgar. You see, they can, they can see a compassion the conservative, as George Bush would describe them, would say, well, hell, uh, at any rate, that, that, uh, well, why is it that instead of teaching somebody to fish, why is it that we're giving them a free lunch? That helps nobody. We're only perpetuating their misery. But my experience, of having lived abroad, is that generally speaking, left-leaning people are more sympathetic to what George Lakoff calls the nurture and parent paradigm of politics, that George Lakoff it was a, it was a leftist social, so, social scientist who wrote a book, How Liberals and Conservatives Think. And generally speaking, he argued that liberals are more likely, but not always do, more likely to be to, to think of, of, um, of, of a country in terms of a nurture and parent paradigm. That a liberal to George Lack of a somebody who is a compassionate authority figure, who, who cuts slack, who doesn't teach people the hard way. You see, it's not to say that he's uncaring. In fact, Viktor Orban, an arch conservative, would say that no, he is in favor of helping humanity in some way. It's just that he doesn't want a free lunch. He doesn't want to prioritize. He doesn't want to give a free lunch to anybody. He doesn't want to prioritize foreigners or his own people. Of course, 
Vector Orban say he has compassion for Hungarians, for Europeans, for Christians. But wait, nobody is going to be spoiled here. Nobody is going to get pampered. And to me, a George Lakoff's position presents a very strong antithesis to, to, the, to the Lewis Brothers thesis. And I'm disappointed that they have never, ever discussed this with Brian Kaplan, with Coleman Hughes, or on anything they ever published. But what I would really like to see is an ongoing debate or an exchange of ideas between George Lakoff the Lewis Brothers, and I'm wondering why is it that nobody has thought of this so far? And I mean here that the one way to, to distinguish between the between liberals and conservatives is not any specific policy actually, but your personality. Are you are you if you were a parent, would you be more likely to think that you should be more of a nurturing parent, or should you be a staunch disciplinarian? Should you be a strict father? Should you teach people to grow for their own your to, to, to get ahead in life the hard way and sometimes fail? Or do you want safe spaces? Do you want to mollycoddle people? Do you want a welfare state? It's not a coincidence. It's so that, that virtually all the supporters of political correctness are and have always been on the left, whatever the hell that may mean in any given country. And what I would really like to see is an integration, a, a dialectical discourse between the Lewis brothers and George Lackett. I want to see a thesis antithesis and a synthesis in this discussion and I, i'd like to i'd like to believe that we can learn from both thinkers and we can derive a much stronger thesis stronger conclusion excuse me from a from a blend of what george lack of published and what lewis brothers published okay florian yeah i have a very interesting points i have a somewhat i realized that uh, when i listen to both uh keith and you alexey i realized that my, maybe my take on this is a little bit, little bit more profane. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, that one one of the reasons we have left right um, this paradigm is uh, and, and when we go with the with what the Lewis brothers called like the team the, the sports team mentality, the reason that we have that I think is branding, right? So basically it's marketing that appeals to people's emotions and sorting into their respective sports team that is an an emotional trigger right and then afterwards people will justify oh yeah yeah because i believe in the free movement of capital or i believe that that we have to help the entire world and and uh, we had um and uh, there are there are i don't remember there was an interview um with one from the blaze tv team and uh, we talked about that 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 basically when we, when we discussed it in in the in the um, in our chat uh, I think we, some of you said that um, the left-right distinction kind of appeared after World War I, which is when Madison Avenue came up. So that would fit with that, right? So that's more of like a, the result of a marketing concept that you have left-right differences. Um, I think uh, uh, one criticism directly to the left-right paradigm that the Lewis brothers uh, basically say it's due to left right sports team um i don't think left right is a correct paradigm anymore i mean now it's like statists or elitists on one end and populists on the other or maybe libertarianism versus uniparty there is a we call them the uniparty right neocons neoliberals it's basically there's no distinction between their what they what they stand for what they want to do politically what they supposedly believe on it's really a big big overlap and then you have someone like trump who used to be on the left but now has basically coalesced like a po populist coalition behind himself uh, same as bolsonaro uh, uh orban in hungary and and uh, like marine Le Pen and all these other new right-wing leaders those are really populists and and so i think uh the the um coherent um measure behind behind this paradigm statism versus populism is the uh, distribution of money and of and of assets right so basically there's a small elite which has uh, the majority of assets and money on their side and those will be more uh, those will overlap very much in their political positions because in the end they basically want to entrench their power and then you have the populists who are kind of on the outside and also want to get some of the assets, right? So, so the populism, uh, populism, elitism paradigm that can be explained with the with the distribution of assets, I think, um, because we have to we have to, and that's really interesting if you look at the evolution of political movements. Um, 
we had this uni party and what happens when you have a uni party in charge neocons neoliberal very similar then you get like populist movements or uh, or what we called in germany the apo also parliamentarische opposition which means um opposition outside the parliament in the in the with the 1968 revolution in germany it also they also like many people like in, in their 20s and 30s like the classical boomers when they came of age they started to see the old political parties as basically one coherent block and they were on the outside of that so it basically doesn't didn't matter if you vote conservative or or liberal back then to them it was all just one uni party and that's very similar to what we see uh, what we see today right so i think if you have a political <clears throat> political movement that coalesces power in the hand of like a very much overlapping elite in, in their political positions. If you have that, then you start getting frayings at the end, right? We see that that more and more people attend extreme political positions, right? So they move away from the middle, and that is how new political movements are born. I mean, we have to we have to be aware that at one point the right wing, the, the right left dichotomy came to play. And that was in the French Revolution, but those people didn't just randomly sit on the right and left. They had very distinct positions, right? They were royalists, and then they were the um, um, I I should know my history better, but the, the royalists and and the opposition, like the revolutionary, right? Call them that. Like they're on the left, and the royalists on the right. And uh, people like Edmund Burke, um, which we called about the classical conservative, were siding with the royalists at that point. And the people that went with uh, that were descendants from Rousseau and from all the other philosophers, they were more to be found on on the on the left. But there was a real difference. It was it wasn't just like two different sports teams, right? And I think that's maybe interesting if you want to think about the future, how political movements are born. At one point, you probably always have a very huge overlapping uni party, and then you have new movement that fray on the side. I also want to see want to say at at one point that we should also keep in mind is. Um, if we are in the U.S., from a European perspective, everything in the U.S. is shades of conservative. So if, if, you, if you ask a German what he thinks about Joe Biden, he will tell you he's a conservative, just not as nutcase conservative as those MAGA people. If you talk among like many people that are politically active in the U.S., they will tell you, especially when they're, when they're more right wing here, uh, they will tell you that in Europe, there's basically shades of liberalism all over Europe. And so there's a real difference that exists between between continents and maybe between countries, but it could also be that everything just seems to be like shades of the same political opinion here in the U.S. because it is kind of like all has all has a conservative pro-capitalist umbrella around it, right? So we should also keep that in mind. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's that's the real interesting interesting result here that uh, that we can use that that uh, sports team metaphor to then see when new teams emerge with new political views and sort of use that to look at the evolution of political movements over time. Yeah, so I think one thing that's interesting that you brought up, Alexei, with regards to the left being a useful concept, not in terms of discrete political issues or a social or a political movement over time, but a mindset or a personality. I'm reminded of the uh, statement by Julius Evola. My principles are only those that before the French Revolution, everybody, every well-worn person considered sane and normal. And I think sort of adjacent to what you said, if left and right is to be meaningful, and I think it still could have a meaningful application, you, you kind of have to scope it out, you know, be more meta than just political parties and platforms because before the industrial revolution, we don't have a left. There just wasn't a left. Everybody was conservative. The entire world was theocratic patriarchies. That's pretty much what it was. There was no country in the world that was left wing in any meaningful sense prior to the industrial revolution. And so then the question is, well, why is that? Well, I think because left uh, is a sort of mindset that is attached to the material conditions of the industrial revolution. And the more embedded you are in that, the more urban you are, the more techni technically oriented you are, like you're a technician, the more financial, maybe you're a Wall Street tycoon, the more you're in that, 
the more your 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 material conditions in part condition you to be a leftist. And this idea of leftism as a set of behavioral traits, you mentioned Jonathan Haidt, yes. Also, if there's like any sort of singular idea that sort of like drives all of this is that uh, it's nominalism. You just deconstruct all known realities, right? I mean, what, 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 do, what do libertarians and Marxists have in common? Well, they don't believe in any fixed point. You can just deconstruct everything and then reconstruct it in your own image. They just differ on what that looks like. I mean, we have Oswald Spengler talking about how communism and capitalism are both two sides of the same coin. They want a level of material prosperity for workers that just disagree on how to get there. And so I think I think the fact that we don't even have a word for the left or even the need to express the term the left prior to the Industrial Revolution, when everything was basically just a theocratic patriarchy, that really tells you something, that the left is... I think contingently related to the material conditions of, of of industrial civilization, maybe even the commercial revolution. But like you know, the commercial revolution begins in the 14th century, and none of the you know, the de Medici's, the Fuggers, they're not leftists. I mean, nobody would call those people leftists. They were still like you know traditional Catholics that supported fighting the Turks on a crusade or something, you know, or like the the Dutch reform in the 17th century with the golden age of the Dutch. Again, they were like Protestant nationalists. They supported causes against the Catholic Church. They weren't really leftists yet. So I, I think it's a kind of mindset that derives from these post-industrial, these industrial and post-industrial conditions, which given that the, the sort of older social structures, uh, uh, you know, living off the land directly is not really what people do anymore. It's sort of an adaptive process. And so it's a spectrum, right? I mean, the even quote unquote conservatives and quote unquote right wing people in America today hold positions that 500 years ago nobody would have believed anywhere, uh, which, which indicates that they're holding beliefs that are still within this pull of the left. Now, the question then is okay, well, well how long will industrial civilization last? We've talked about this before. We have different answers to that. But I think that's where the left really comes from. And if that were to go away, the left would go away too. I mean, people might remember it as some like past era of history, but without these conditions that make it possible, it would just be seen as a bad dream or something. Because how could you do it now, right? You, you don't have, I mean, for example, you can't have feminism without birth control. You can't have feminism without all these technologies that don't exist uh, prior to industrial civilization. So... That's that's what I would I would say, uh, adding to the idea that it's a, a mindset that like Ted Kaczynski and others would point to. Uh, we'll go to you, Keith. Yeah, there's a lot here. Um, I tend to lean towards uh, an idea that's called genopolitics, which is the idea that people are born with a genetic proclivity to have certain kinds of approaches to political and social and cultural questions because um, people are born with a genetic proclivity to have a certain personality structure and a certain certain psychological makeup and then how they their personality is structured and what kind of psychological wiring they have is going to shape how they react to social circumstances and ideas that they're presented with and and life experience and that kind of stuff so the way that someone's uh, experiences in that sense, social experiences expressed is going to be dependent in large degree on their genetically endowed personality structure. Now, the particular form it takes may vary widely in terms of uh, social or political conditions. For instance, uh, somebody who has a personality structure that's inclined towards traits that are normally thought of as being conservative, if they're born in the former Soviet Union, they're probably going to be a hardline communist. Uh, whereas if they are endowed genetically with personality traits that are commonly associated with what Westerners think of as a liberal, within a system like that, they may support reformists like you know, Mikhail Gorbachev or Boris Yeltsin or something like that. But all of that is entirely culturally relative. Uh, you know, I know back in the Cold War, I remember back when Mikhail Gorbachev first became 
uh, premier of the Soviet Union, and everybody uh, would talk about how he was implementing reforms, but then, but then he was up against these conservatives who don't want to have reform, you know, which at the time sounded nonsensical in an American sense because conservatives in America tended to be hardline anti-communists back then. But their counterparts in Russia, they were the ones that wanted to preserve communism. You know, their their, you know, personality structured you know counterparts. Um, I know. Uh, so a few years back, when the debacle in Charlottesville happened over the Confederate monuments, uh, I wrote a, a an essay or just a blog post, really, about uh, that incident. And I was saying this is a war of psychological tribes. That is. You know, because I was I was interested in the question of what would motivate people to want to go out and get in a street fight over statues. You know, what, what, why would anybody care that much about statues? And I was drawing on the work of Kaczynski and others talking about different personality traits and psychological makeups and how you know these kinds of activities are a manifestation of, of different personality structures. Uh, so I think that that's the the backstory to all of this. You know, they, they you have people with certain personality traits that are genetically endowed, and how those traits are expressed is socially contingent or culturally relative. Uh, you know, a conservative in, a, in another context might be something radically different than what we think of as a conservative in our society. For instance, I, I've read a lot about the the Spanish Civil War and the anarchist contingent in the Spanish Civil War. And I think that if the anarchists had been the victorious team in that particular war, that it, and, and if figures like Duruti and Garcia Oliver had survived, they would have been conservatives in that context. They seem to have a lot of the personality traits that you, know, you think of as conservative. Um, you know, and, and, and that applies to American politics as well. Like, and I think the Lewis brothers would agree with this. Like, Back in the 1960s, when we had all the cultural and social upheavals, uh, one of the hallmarks of being on the left at that time was you had to be against the draft and you had to be in favor of legalizing marijuana. You know, that was really you know, those two things were as much as anything else, hallmarks of being on the, the radical left in the 1960s. But of all the prominent public intellectuals of that time period, one of the most uh, staunch, one that was most staunchly in favor of ending the draft and legalizing marijuana was Milton Friedman, who was considered to be on the right, even the far right. You know, he was an advisor to Richard Nixon. He was an advisor to Ronald Reagan. Right? So by, but by the standards of the time, you would think, well, no, he should be on the radical left. Right? So even in, in that context, it's, it's hard to differentiate between the two. Uh, in certain ways, but I do think that there are personality traits that are reflected uh, in individuals related to their social circumstances. Um, a lot of people today who are considered to be progressives or on the left strike me as inherently conservative, uh, meaning that they or or they they exhibit traits that are often that conservatives are stereotyped as being. For instance, one of the stereotypes of the of conservatives is the the church lady type who wants to go and produce and police everyone's morals. You know, like there's a there back in the 80s, there was a Saturday Night Live character called the church lady, and the church lady was you know this kind of stereotype of this uptight um, you know uh, lady that's just always going around and criticizing everybody else and, and that kind of stuff. But nowadays we have the stereotype of the Karen. And the Karen, you know, is basically kind of like the church lady character from uh, Saturday Night Live, only that the Karen is like a progressive, you know, is somebody that's going around saying, well, you're not woke, you know, why aren't you recycling and why aren't you getting your pronouns right? And where's your Black Lives Matter banner, you know? It, uh, so, and I think that that represents a shift in culture, whereas, uh, Somebody who might have been a moral majority member 50 years ago today might be just as inclined to be a woke progressive uh, because it has to do with virtue signaling, you know, or, or, you know, like we could say that in the 1950s, if you wanted to engage in virtue signaling and show that you are a respectable person, um, uh, you, uh, you might say, well, you're against communism, 
Uh, you might go to church every Sunday and you might donate to the Salvation Army and you might say, I don't smoke or drink or any of that stuff. You know, I'm a, I'm a moral person. Um, and nowadays, a person with that kind of personality type might say, well, you know, I recycle, you know, I donate to the Sierra Club, I get my pronouns right, I've got my BLM banner on my bumper sticker, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I vote for the most pro-gay candidate there is in every election, uh, and, and, but I, and while those might seem like polar opposite ideas, I, I think in some ways there is a personality structure that can cause them to overlap. Uh, now, that's not to say people don't have sincere opinions about things. Uh, but I do think that the way people relate to, to social and cultural circumstances is heavily dependent on their personality structure. But then the way the personality structure is manifested is entirely relative to social and cultural circumstances. Um, the, um, I, as far as the material element of this, you know, the Marxists, of course, believe that uh, ideas are simply an outgrowth of material conditions. I don't agree with that, but I do think there's some partial truth to it, because if we look today at what the principal dividing line in, in American politics is, um, research shows it comes down to, to education levels, like people with a college education are much more likely to be on the left, whereas people without a college education are more likely to be on the right. I mean, there are exceptions, but these, this is the general paradigm. Um, however, I think that's also a proxy in some ways for class. It's basically the traditional working class versus the upper middle class. And I think that's a, a proxy in some ways for, for functional uh, issues because the, uh, the real dividing line seems to be that the wokest, most politically correct people tend to be in the ideas industries, what, what I call, or some people call them knowledge workers, but people who work in the tech industry people who work in the in education and media and journalism and entertainment and marketing and advertising in, in education in, in the public sector bureaucracy in, in elements of the corporate sector like like um, human resources and that kind of stuff I know in my own experience that's where you find the wokest people and, and the data seems to show that the wokest people most politically correct people tend to be, in the ideas industries or the other or, or tend to be knowledge workers of some kind um and i think that represents a, a, a shifting uh class dimension because in, in past times we didn't have nearly as many people in those particular types of fields and for, because those fields just weren't as large and for some reason as those fields have grown they've absorbed people who are probably in some ways are genetically predisposed to have the kinds of personality traits that you see among these classes of people. Uh, you know, it, it's created openings for this uh, in, in ways you might not have had in past times. Uh, meanwhile, people who are being left behind, uh, like I, one thing I've noticed, for example, is that a lot of these MAGA people don't really fit the description of a conservative. Like whenever I've encountered some of these people personally and hear heard some of their ideas, um, frequently, they don't sound much like people I would have thought of as conservative, you know, even 20 years ago, much less 40 years ago. For instance, a lot of them don't go to church uh, or aren't particularly religious. You know, some of them use drugs. You know, some of them are, you know, are in unconventional sexual relationships. You know, it's a it's a it's a much different type of right wing than what it might might have been on the right wing in the past. In fact, I've even heard some analysts, and I think with some force argue that the, the what's, what gets passed off as the right today is almost like the new left used to be in the 60s in the sense that it's it's anti-establishmentarianism often for its own sake often to the point of just being transgressive for its own sake just like in the 1960s you had you know people radicals who said well i'm just not going to bathe anymore because you know why does society arbitrarily say we should bathe forget bathing i'm just not going to bathe i'm going to just you know smell as bad as I possibly can. And if people are offended by that, well, that's great because that means I'm giving the middle finger to bourgeois society. That was a, a that, that actually happened. You had people like that back in the day. And, and, and I see some of that on the right today. I see some people on some of these alt-right circles, for instance, that they just seem like they're about trying to be as transgressive as they possibly can. They're like, oh, you thought that was racist? Well, check this out. You know, you thought this was gay bashing? Well, check this out. You know, um, 
And so it seems to be, it's like the roles have almost reversed in certain ways. Okay, Alexi. How <laughs> Richard Hanani wrote a wonderful essay a couple of months ago about how conservatives are the new counterculture, much the same way that African Americans were in the 1960s. And that's exactly in the way that Keith described it. You see that as fragmented and as divided as the American society may be today, there's still some notion of a mainstream society. There is no going away from it. Unfortunately, nowadays, it seems to me that Obama probably started the seventh party realignment system. To me, Barack Obama is the most consequential president in our lifetime. Barack Obama has drifted us away from from the idea of equality before the law and toward equality as outcomes among different racial groups. For me, Barack Obama is the emperor of the woke system. You see that if you take the, uh, the perspective of the abominators, I would call them, that you would have to say, well, all right, so what does it mean to make a better society? Let's say that you're from Cuba. Does this mean that you want a better society for everybody, like a free market utopia, some, some far, far left, far right, so to speak? And our capitalists will say, no, no. Okay, well, let's narrow it down a little bit. How about in a utopia for uh, Latin American people? Oh, hell no. In fact, in southern Florida, car dealers have a lot of trouble selling cars for a simple reason that a lot of the car commercials are, are are acted out by voice actors with a Mexican accent. And there are a few ethnic groups that Cubans from Miami hate more than Mexicans. And they really, the car commercials would have been more effective had these things been done with a Southern American accent. You see, the other day, I, I've seen a funny little YouTube video by, by of course, a, a Latin American person who said that America is a place where gringos treat you well, but your biggest enemies are other Latinos. And there is some truth to that. If you go to Southern Florida and see how Spanish-speaking people treat each other, there is really not much solidarity between the Dominicans and, and uh, Cubans. And to be sure, nobody likes Mexicans because Mexicans have a reputation for being exceptionally hardworking and industrious. So there was a lot of envy, ignorance, and resentment. Now, they may say that a lot of Americans are ignorant, that they don't know the difference between Mexico and Cuba. They, they think that all of us, Mexico, somehow. But I'm not seeing the kind of animosity, the kind of cultural animus toward, uh, toward the American culture as a whole, as I do, between, between different Latin American groups. To me, this, is, this was intensified by, by the Barack Hussein Obama administration. It's an abomination, and abominators are, are essentially pitting all against all. They're, create, they're creating a Hobbesian state of nature as we speak. And this Hobbesian state of nature means that we don't really care who, if society as a whole is better off. I mean, can you imagine Obama supporters talking about any kind of utopia that suits everybody? How about better a better place for people of color well do you think that a, a, an immigrant from niger will have kind words to say about the african-american culture i doubt it what, what about an immigrant from kenya do you think he's going to show solidarity for nigerians i am even more skeptical i would say that the racial relations of this sort will be even more strained than what you see between mexicans and cubans this this kind of this kind of a, of a notion of counterculture is, is not only conservative. I'm seeing this uh, even within the, within the left. You see that, if, if anything, uh, the woke left, and, and, and there are many, there are many different strands of the woke left, like turf feminism, anti turf feminism, the environmentalists, the proponent, opponents of environmental homophobia, blah, 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 blah. They all they all align with the policies of the, of the tech oligarchy. They all love censorship against the WASP community. That's the only thing they have in common. They may hate each other, but they hate the WASP, real Americans, so to speak, and, and they channel their hatred in the, in, the, in the way they express their feelings for Donald Trump. But the reality is that America is degenerating into a Hobbesian state of nature of war against all, of all against all. I believe this started with the abomina abomination that began with, the, uh, with, with, with President Barack Hussein Obama II. And if we 
take a look at this from the perspective of the of Neil Hove and William Strauss's fourth turning theory. This is the first fourth turning president. He is the kind of an FDR of of the uh, of, of our epoch. So if uh, if abomination becomes canonical in the same sense that FDR's ideology became the foundation of the era that we're in, we're all in big trouble because I do not see how uh, an abomination of this sort will create anything resembling the kind of unity that FDR's political system did, flawed as it may have been. Okay, uh, Florian. Yeah, uh, very interesting. I think, yeah, that's true. I mean, Obama incorporated lots of the... Um, Obama basically had this cultural... It, it basically initiated this cultural shift. I remember well uh, 2008, um, George Bush, that government had, that administration had completely discredited itself. And what Obama very smartly did, smartly for his, for his perspective, of course, was he brought all the enthusiastic people that were just ready to go into the workforce and about like between 20 and 30 years old. So they were not complete greenhorns. They, he had many, many seasoned political analysts and they went to work. And then within a few years, the entirety of Washington DC was uh, uh, was completely um, transformed into a left-wing Starbucks uh, community, basically, right? And so uh, you see that that many many TV shows, many TV series from the from the teens, 2010 to 2020, they weren't really very good, right? So all the talk shows, they all said the same. It was kind of like a whole whole cultural alignment that happened on the left and Obama always could come across as a reasonable statesman. Right. And then, but the, you know, the, the, the ghosts that he, that he called on, they were really crazy and they carried wokeism, uh, wokeism out there. I agree with Alexei is probably Obama who was at the, at the root of this all um, because he has never called on the left to stop their overreach or something like that. He kind of like lets it happen. And people have said that Biden's presidency is basically Obama's third term, which uh, which may not be may not be too crazy of an idea, given how mentally invigorated uh, Biden actually appears. Uh, there's just I I thought about the old all the time. What would be what would be an essence between political opinions if there is any? And uh, I I was reminded of that when uh, Keith talked about genopolitics. I think in, in general, there's a genetic component of political leaning, and that's the ability to amass assets, right? And that's also reflected in the mindset of people, as Todd said, um, because I think that in many cases, mindset determines the ability to be productive, right? And how, how good are you in collecting assets, collecting money, putting yourself in a better position, which basically means like pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, right? So, and, and um, now genopolitics, uh, the, the ability to amass assets overlaps perfectly well with, with the cultural environment, right? If you look at the Soviet Union communist caters, they were really good at amassing the relevant assets. You need to recognize which assets will bring you to the top, right? So, um, so someone who was able to get assets for himself, to get money, to make money, or to get the assets needed to get into positions of power, some people are very good at doing that, and those tend to be conservatives and um, and you know then maybe the left encompasses more of like a savviness and street smart uh, a sense and of course people can be both right for example Milton Friedman may be someone who was very good in, uh, in you know in capital in you know capitalist execution of his ideals but also had a little knack for for a bit like a revolutionary uh, spirit in him right so it's both possible but I think that's really the only the one common trait to conservatives versus liberals that conservatives will be better able to amass assets and therefore go into the therefore climb up uh, into a higher status uh, in, in society all right uh, now it's time to move into final thoughts I'll just say I, I broadly agree with what the Lewis brothers have stated I think this kind of criticism of the the, the mishmash bundle, of American politics is much needed. That's all I got. So, uh, Keith, final thoughts? Yeah, with the qualification that I do think people have a genetic endowment for certain personality traits and that 
these traits shape how they react to social and cultural circumstances. I generally agree with the Lewis brothers thesis that politics is often defined as a mishmash of issues that don't really fit together in many ways. Like one of the most uh, contentious elections in American history was the election of 1800. Um, and you had the Democratic Republicans of Thomas Jefferson and the Federalists of uh, Alexander Hamilton and John Adams. And it, 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 with, the, with hindsight, if we tried to put those into the left-right spectrum, it would be a bit hard to do because on one hand, the Federalists were generally elitists. They favored a stronger, uh, more friendly relationship with Great Britain. You know, and keep in mind, this is like, you know, just a, a few years out of the American Revolution. Uh, they also favored economic policies that would be considered comparatively statist. I mean, they were big on protective tariffs and they were big on, uh, you know, what, what they would call corporate welfare or public-private partnerships. Internal improvements was the word they used for it back then. So, um, so, but they, you know, they, that was one side. And then the Jeffersonian uh, Democratic Republicans, they were for states' rights. They were for local sovereignty. Uh, they also favored a more open immigration policy. Uh, they were also, though, the party of the South, and they were also pro-slavery. Um, and but they, at the same time, they supported the French Revolution. Uh, so how would you, where would you put somebody like that uh, on today's political spectrum? Uh, you know, really nowhere. Um, you know, in, in that context, which of those two sides would have been the conservatives or, or, or right wingers and what side would have been the left wingers? Uh, it's, you know, it, it, you can't really say because it's totally irrelevant. It's a totally different set of social circumstances. I suppose in terms of personality traits, you could say that Jefferson is a, a prototypical leftist and someone like Alexander Hamilton or John Adams might have been a prototypical conservative uh, or right winger. Uh, but they, again, it doesn't really fit in, in you know, in, in terms of their, uh, the context, you know, it's just, it's a totally different world. You know, it's just like today, uh, if we look at a country that's totally different uh, from the Western countries, if you look at somewhere like uh, Afghanistan, you know, what would, a, what would a leftist in Afghanistan be? Is that somebody that wants to be a, a little less Taliban-ish, you know, or you know, what is a right winger in, in in Afghanistan? Is that a is that somebody that wants to go back to their former monarchy? It, it, you know, it's, it's, so it's not it's not relevant. Okay, final thoughts, Alexei. I'm going to follow up on Keith's uh, thoughts here. What does it mean to be left or right in the in the context of the Arab world? You guys, Todd and Keith, may remember that you had a friend of mine on the show, Ajir, who's the Kurdish dissident. And he has spent a lot of time living in Europe. He's a Finnish citizen. He speaks English, as you've seen. He speaks Finnish, some Spanish. And I would say he's an example of a liberal person in Turkey, that specific cultural context. Now, what does this mean? So uh, he is one of eight children. And his father was also liberal because he was an anarchist. See, in that historical context, being anarchist against the Islamic uh, way of governing meant that you are that you were essentially a liberal. And in the Turkey in the 1990s, early 2000s, there has been, there has been a left wing turn towards secularization. So conservatives have come back with a vengeance and elected Erdogan. So what does Ajir define as his politics by his hatred for Erdogan? That's what the interview was about. But all right, what does this mean? Is this just a fad? Is this just a culture specific notion? Or is there something deeper to it? Well, I'm going to argue that there is something here that the Lewis brothers have missed. Ajir, to me, has the personality of a person who would probably be liberal, not only in Turkey, but also in Finland, as he was, in fact. In fact, in Finland, he was not a supporter of what was known as conservatives. Some of these people were white nationalists. Some of these people were Finnish identitarians. But Ajir was considered to be a black Finnish. He was, in fact, a citizen of Finland with full Finnish. He was seen as a liberal, and he was seen as a progressive in a lot of ways in that context. But is there something fundamental about this person that makes them more of a leftist as a matter of personality rather than a rightist? I would say that there is, and not in the way that Theodor Kaczynski imagined. Theodor Kaczynski was talking about the victim mentality that leftists in America still have. In that context, no. I would say that typically a conservative across the world 
is the person who is very family oriented most of the time. And uh, despite his father's uh, liberal leanings, being an anarchist and all, he had eight children and he married an ultra conservative woman and he grew up in a small town. See, if you go to any country, this kind of a person may secretly wish to be a liberal, but if he is a family man and if he is traditional in the way society defines it and he upholds the values of that society, then maybe he's more of a conservative than a liberal. What about Ajir? Well, Ajir left his culture at a fairly young age. And he, so then in that sense, he's liberal. And he is not really a strict Muslim. You know, he works at a bar. He used to be a bouncer, bartender. That he, he likes, he enjoys the nightlife. So this and then not in any, not really be fitting in any conservative culture anywhere. Not in Turkey, not in Finland, not in Spain where he was, not in the U.S., if he were to go to any country, he would be seen as a, as a left-leaning person, perhaps center-left. Some people might even say that about his father, who is perhaps center-right, but given that he's an anarchist, he's just a pure centrist as a matter of personality. Well, all right, let's, take, let's, bring, let's go back home a little bit, the United States. What does Ajir have in common with two famous presidents of the U.S., Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump? Both of these presidents have grown up on the far left. They have had a lot of life of a free spirit. Just like Ajir, they had their own share of partying. They had their own share of being a social deviant in some way. They all, they, they both they decided to become Republicans later on in life and really molded the Republican Party in their own image. But let's just be honest, though. Had Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump been actual conservatives in the way that most people of the world understand it, I mean, they would have been family men, first of all. They would have been going to church with them. They would have been very delicate and, de and decorous in the way they speak. They would have even tried to imitate the king of England in some cases. But no, these guys are just liberals who took advantage of the shifting cultural trends and they manipulated the left and right distinction. But as, as far as personality is concerned, there is such a thing as being liberal, a liberal person or a conservative person. And the difference, I would say, could never be any clearer than, say, between Ajir and his mother, who is a traditional Islamic woman, a family person, and Ajir is not a family man. It's, see, some conservatives would say that it's a criticism, but it's not. And some liberals would say it's a compliment. But I would say that the attitude and family values is what makes somebody liberal or conservative. And I do believe that George Lakoff was definitely onto something when he linked the idea of how we think of family and how we think of a government. So if you are a family-oriented person, well, you, wanna, you want the government to support family values, to keep families together in one way or the other. Well, okay, but if you're not so family-oriented, maybe you support the kind of Finnish welfare state where families are free to break up as low, uh, let the welfare state pick up the pieces. So as far as that, I would say there are some fundamental personality differences that account for left and right leaning personalities across the world all right florin you get the last word oh okay uh great um so yeah i think uh, alexei put uh, put the finger on something very very important the family orientation because family is always the unit that is taking resources away from the state right so statism and and the focus on family cannot really coexist right so i think uh, i think that's that's a very good, astute observation um, that could really be a characteristic, characteristic difference between uh, left and right. Um, from otherwise, like uh, I agree with a lot what we said today. Um, I just got thinking about when we looked at Karens or church ladies. I think if we want to know who has the power, we look at the Karens of society. I think Karens reflect the current power structure in an involuntary, ironic overreach. And that's my last word. All right. Now, before we wrap up, we have a few super chats. Uh, we have, did we fail for 10 euros? Thank you very much. Great discussion. Keep up the good work, guys. Thank you. And then we have blog of the West for 999 US dollars for the group. Thank you. All right, everyone. This is Todd Lewis. Uh, thank you, Keith, uh, Alexei, and Florian for being here. It's always a pleasure. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Fly podcast signing off.